I'm joined with former Mayo footballer Enda Varley to talk about the huge Connacht final clash this weekend with Galway. 46 titles apiece. Because this is knockout, Enda, does it, fe- does it feel like it means more again? I would do no shame. Um, I didn't know that. It's 46 apiece. 46, 46 apiece, apiece. Yeah, yeah. You probably um, have one or two yourself from the famous five in a row recently. Five row, yeah. I would have got four myself, I'd say. Um, so, look, yeah, knockout would always bring a certain a certain amount of pressure. Obviously, there's no back door. There's, um, you know, the league the league meeting a couple of, what, three, three weeks ago. It won't be like that. Um, I think it'd be, a, it'd be a tighter game this time, for sure. Mm. And, like, the, the manner of that defeat, too, and the fact that, you know, uh, Damien Damien Comer has gone off injured since he's par- apparently out of the game. Shane Walsh is only working his way back in. Like that defeat, do you think that that's going to give confidence to Mayo or actually kind of burn Galway to the point where they'll look to lay down a marker? Yeah, a bit of both. Like it, it would have been Galway's, um, would you say, second string team? Like it just said to me, uh, like uh, at the time, I I I was kind of mystified as in like if I'm a going guy you know in the 26 I'm trying to break on to that 15 like uh, it just it proves to me that the, the kind of the, the male strength and depth in terms of their squad now their James has built nicely that there's much more strength and depth in the male side than there is going side going, going from that game but I, I do realise it is a strange year um, you know, this year, let's be honest, it's been kind of all over the shop and training and lads, you know, gyms closed down again. You know, it, 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 like Mayo, I know Mayo had kept in touch during the summer months, um, doing the Zoom meetings and, and stuff like that. And he, like, I'm not too sure. Like, it looked to me that Mayo were, were way ahead of going at that, at that stage three weeks ago. Do you, how impressed have you been with the younger players like Oshin Mullen, Owen McLaughlin, yeah. Ryan O'Donoghue, even, even Mark Moore who came in uh, in that goal again and yeah. spoke too? It's been, that's been a, fr- a fresh breath, a fresh breath air, is that the right? Breath of fresh uh, air, breath, even? Breath of fresh air, <laughs> yeah. breath of fresh air. But uh, yeah, no, it's like, look, it's it's like father time waits for no man, as you know. So uh, the guys who are in their 30s now, the likes of Cullum, Zippy, uh, Tom Harrison, Shane O'Shea, like, uh, like them, them guys, uh, you know, I, I'd expect probably Zippy and, and Colum to get maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes the next day, and, uh, you know, if, if the game's close and they're trying to close it out, like, that, that wealth of experience is invaluable. But the young players have come in, they've been they've been shown brilliantly the athleticism of Mo McLaughlin, Oshin Mullen, um, you know, again, they all have. The springboard again from the back line. You, you have Oshin, you have Leroy, you have Paddy Durkin, you have Owen McLaughlin, like Chrissy and Stevie Cohen will be more more defenders as in they sit uh, sit back a bit more mind the house. But it's like they have a rotation before them who goes at each time. And I know as a forward, like it'd be an absolute pain in the hole trying to you know they're dictating things. Like do you know what I mean? So them four guys running after them like. Like if they go three or four times in a half, you're running after them and they're dictating to you instead of the other way around. Like so, if and that's what I'm thinking too. With, with, on, on Sunday, like if going get a foothold in midfield, that's why midfield is so important on Sunday. If they get a foothold in that midfield, well, Mayo half back line won't have that springboard to, to launch forward. So that's why the middle third now is so important on Sunday. Let's let's imagine that Shane Walsh does play in this match because we saw him coming on against Dublin and there's been no Galway match in the meantime because the Sligo game obviously was awarded yeah. to Galway. If you if you look at the matchups that James Horan picked the other day, like uh, Lee Keegan going and Cahill Craig decisively yeah. won that battle. Paddy Durkin yeah. had Enda Smith going the other way. Both of those lads yeah. were taken off. Durkin scores two points. Who goes on Shane Walsh? I'll be Leroy, hundred percent. Yeah, Leroy, Leroy will take him up. I'd say, um, ah, he will absolutely. Like uh, Shane Walsh is, is, um, is always number one. Like uh, Jamie Comer is obviously a huge loss to them. Um, so yeah, James is usually they will discuss their matchups now this week. Who they want to, who they want to put on. But Leroy, Leroy is still their number one mark. Like if, if you want someone um, out of the game, like Leroy's your man. And is is there any? Like, what are you worried about when you're looking at this Galway team at the moment? Paul Conroy has been shown well recently. Shane Walsh may light it up. Liam Silk's a really good player. 
What are you worried about? Uh, I'm worried about the middle third, to be honest. I'm worried that our physicality, you're, we haven't... Um, I don't want to be too critical because it's, it's obviously it's a strange year. Like but we say, Madrid and Connor off just there will be question marks there in terms of their physicality. Now I know Edo Edo will be coming in and out. I don't think people have noticed this, but Connor seems to be. I I I, I think that they're kind of switching in and out from full forward to midfield. Edo's coming out a bit uh, if they're under pressure, and I think that that'll have to be that'll have to be the case on 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 Sunday. I, I think go like. Middle third for me would be a big worry because if we don't get a foothold in that middle third, obviously our half back and the springboard, uh, they won't have any springboard, so you know they'll be on the back foot. Um, so that's my main concern. Um, you see, all were scum on the last day, they launched and very unusual now, but conditions will dictate this that you know there'd be more long ball going out the middle third because conditions are so bad. Uh, do do. Uh, goalies and defences want to take that risk of giving that 20 yard out ball from the kick out and summing up your hole. So there's going to be more 50. It's going to be a bit more, it's going to be a bit more old school, to be honest, with the, the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, going into the All Ireland series. And like Mayo probably end up posting Aidan O'Shea almost full time out to midfield if nearly every kick out was going out there and Galway were winning them. Well, yeah, you, you saw Russ Common, I probably counted the first four or five kickouts that the keeper had, he, he went along with it. Yeah. So that, that tells me, obviously, meetings beforehand, well, they're looking at Mayo as they feel that they don't respect them. So that's up to Mayo and field now on Sunday to lay down a marker. Conor Loftus is new in there. Matthew Ryan obviously had a breakout season last year, but it's up to them to lay down the marker and, you know, set things straight basically and say, yeah, we're, we're here to. We're here to mix things up. And Andy Moran said after the last game that uh, about Killian O'Connor, he changed us from a decent team to a really good team with just one player. To me, I rate him up there at the highest. I think he's one of the best players going. Like, uh, and he talked about his form in the last maybe eighteen months was unbelievable. But do you do you see him hitting top form and, and is he in that top bracket? Uh, yeah, and I'm not just saying that. Like, Killian wouldn't exactly be uh, be loved by the dubs here, but. Like it's, he it's, sure it brings is. It <laughs> <laughs> brings a certain physicality to things. People like that, but uh, I think he's, he's addressed that. But like people take for granted now that like he, he scored nine points the last day, and yes, uh, I'm not too sure many frees to work, but you still have to like the free taker. He makes Mayo into an uh, I'm not going to say an average team, into an average team to a better team. Purely from his free taking, as in, like you're guaranteed ninety percent of his free is going to go over, and he just keeps the team taking over with that. But in saying that too, I don't want to disrespect him in saying like, oh, he brings nothing from play. Like the last day, he scored three or four points from play, uh, showed very well for the ball, very intelligent, creates space for other people. Except NATO are working well in tangent inside with each other. They're two very intelligent players, and they work well off each other. You know, they, they, they're nearly like, you know like a string like they're pretty much 30 yards away from each other all the time in that foot forward like uh, they, don't, they don't want to you know create that distance like Tommy Conroy another good find for Mayo he seems to be kind of coming out to 45 working hard creating that link with Kevin McLaughlin who another guy that's coming into form as well at the right time Did you think it was unusual to see Kevin McLaughlin wearing number 6 in the previous game? I did yeah and it wasn't I just think and again I don't want to be too critical but you're you're throwing Kevin in there like a six to me. It's such an integral position. Kevin offers so much. Now, Kevin's a very intelligent player. If you ask him, like Kevin plays six. He plays six, no problem. But I think Stephen Cole is the more sensible option. He's a more defensive minded player. Um, you know, he's what is he now? He's about twenty five now at this stage. He's he's coming into his peak years, and he's a very intelligent player in terms of he's more a six to me. It has to be more defensive minded. Mind your full back line. Um, if your man is drifting off, well, then you're you're cheating back to create that plus one at the back to help out your back line because you know obviously a lot of teams want to go along to the foot forward line. And you know, in in the Connacht Championship the last few years, 16, 17, 18, I think Galway beat Mayo. Then last year, yeah. Ross Common beat Mayo. And do you think the the fact that Mayo have played the way they have in the last couple of games, maybe the Leitrim one, they're always going to win, is something to do with? will beat Ross Common when it actually really matters. Like, you remember a couple of years ago at Croke Park, mm. hammering them out the gate. That it's yeah, one thing beating yeah, us yeah. in Mayo when there's a trap door and maybe we're not fully switched on. But when it's championship and knockout, Mayo are going to step up. 
I think, to be honest, uh, the last few years, the, the, the team was, it was just purely looking for the All Ireland series. As in, I don't want to, not disrespecting Connor, but then teams caught Mayo in the hop. If, the, if it wasn't a backdoor system, I think Mayo would have been switched, switched on more. It's just the fact that as you get older, you're kind of, I'm not going to say your motivation changes, but you know, you're, you're trying to peak at the right time. Uh, but with this, younger squad and it is a younger squad now James has transitioned quite well that these young players are hungry and they want they want a kind of title and they're building nicely um, they're building nicely into the kind of final and it's it's nice you, you could even see the progression from the team from February March when the, the whole thing got shut down to now even the likes of obviously the younger players Mark Moore and Owen McLaughlin uh, Oshie Mullen um, these guys have, have kind of physically uh, stepped stepped up to the mark and they, they, they look good finds. Mm. Do, do you have any idea what happened with Galway's who can, can be so good earlier on in the league and then you know there's obviously Covid and there's eight months without playing mm. but they looked terrible against Mayo and then mm. they were a bit better against Dublin but they were always at arm's length. Always at arm's length yeah again change like individually you, you gotta ask questions from the players what they're doing during the six months they're off um you know um, accountability honesty like from from their own game as well that's why i can't imagine it like it's a, it's a local derby you haven't played football they probably had a challenge match before that game they haven't played football for months and you think to be itching to go but yet like it was very lackluster. It was no energy about them, no fight. Um, didn't didn't seem like there was a game plan. Um, to me, Russian Russian Jamie Comer, you know, it, it was a um, talk of him missing the game with a hamstring uh, strain or a tweak in the hamstring, but yet they, they throw him in. Um, is that panic? Just strange. Is that, is yeah, that small, yeah, small. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I felt when I was watching the game, I was just shaking my head. I was like, I couldn't. I believe us how how poor they were um so yeah look they're obviously this sunday there is going to be a bite in them it just depends can Mayo keep them at arm's length um i, I expect Mayo to win by probably four or five points i think they're a better team uh, one to 15 uh, i really do i think i think they're we're peaking at the right time and even it shows the the mentality in terms of you know, Mayo got relegated from Division One, which is a huge thing. But it's right, brush that off. Next game, um, they lost to Tyrone by points. It wasn't a true reflection of, I think, where that team is at. Um, so look, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I'm taking a bit of a leap here, but bear with me. Mayo, Mayo are, I like even the book is actually called it close enough, like ten to eleven, eleven to ten. Yeah. But like, it feels like Mayo are definitely favourites to win this game. Then you have to beat a Division Three team, and you're into an All Ireland final. For you normally have the hard road. For once, it's opening up for you. Yeah, um, <laughs> dangerous. That's dangerous talk now. Yeah. Um, look, all Mayo, and all you can do is you know yourself, Shane, as a player. You usually be thinking like, if we play, if Mayo play at their best, right, and go and play at their best, I expect Mayo to win. But obviously, if if you're off. If your attitude's off, if execution's off, decision making, all that, that's off on the day. But then you're going to lose. But all being 100%, uh, Galway and Mayo side by side, I, I'd be expecting Mayo to, to get through it. And then you're going on to the All Ireland series. Look, Kerry, Kerry obviously felt that as well. You can't, it's, it's so, so dangerous because with the conditions now in the winter months, like you, you saw, you saw Dublin beat Westmead by 11 points. And it was a fair, that's a fair clipping, like, but in Crow Park, that could have been 20, 22 points, drier conditions, you know, the, the really good teams literally put you away in the first half, especially Dublin. So, um, and Cork have improved, and that's, we're talking, we're talking about Cork now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, keep writing them off, keep writing them off. <laughs> we're also talking about Tipperary, you know, come through, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100% yeah, yeah. Um, yeah look Tip Ray could come, come around now and be Cork in the, in the most fine you don't know so yeah I mean, it could be Tip it could be Tip and Cork in the, in the Ireland or Tip and Tip Cork Cork. in the Ireland semi-final yeah yeah actually have, did you see much from Dublin to suggest they've slowed down any way shape or form they're against the Leash team that beat Longford by two points yeah look um, obviously they'll, they'll probably they'll probably beat Leash let's be honest um, 
Yeah, I, I'd probably say their squad isn't as, as, as strong as it was. You're, you're talking Dublin's peak, peak was probably back in the, would you say back 16, 17 was Dublin's peak? Um, there were two peak years. I'm not just saying that now because obviously they bet me all, but like that, you know, their age profile is quite good. Um, you know, you have the likes of your retirements come off now, obviously Burns, two years gone, jamie has gone this year. That experience of the bench, you know, their, their subs, Paddy Andrews, Kevin Mack, they're all getting older. You know, th- their age profile, it's pushing on a bit. Uh, and they're trying to introduce, they're trying to transition their team slowly as well. So it's, Desi has a tough job because transition the team while you're still winning is always going to be harder because obviously we're taking a two, three time all-star out of the team for a new guy coming in when there's going to be some criticism. So that's the balance he has to get right now is going to be, it's going to be a tough job. Were you surprised to see Dermot Connolly step away, your club mate? Um, was I surprised? Probably, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, uh, it, uh, only he can tell you what the conversation he had with Jesse was like. Um, possibly he was going to be, you know, um, you know his 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 starting position would have been up for grabs. Maybe you know last year he came on the All Ireland final at half time. Did he want to be a, an impact bench player? I'm not too sure. So only only the two then can tell you what that conversation what conversation they had. Uh, but look, Jim is Jim is probably thirty three now. You know he's he's done done pretty much everything you can do in the game. So uh, it wasn't too much uh, surprise either. I suppose. Mm. The final question, the most awkward of all: Who's going to win the All Ireland? <laughs> Oh Jesus! <laughs> I can't. I can't. Uh, I like. I thought Kerry. I thought Kerry at the start of the year, and they absolutely botched botched me uh, last Saturday. Was it Sunday or Saturday? Sunday? Sunday, Sunday. Um, Sunday, yeah. So, look, you you have to you have to still give Dublin the edge. I I, I still I think that chasing back is catching them. Um, I think Mayo are coming, uh, but I think it's probably a year too soon for them. Um, I think they'd be serious contenders. No, in saying that, in saying that too, as you said, there's a nice clear path for them. They, they could easily get to an All Ireland final, and then you know Mayo. You presume like Dublin have to play Johnny Gall in the semi final on that side. So um, you know, one off game, Dublin Mayo, the rivalry is fierce. Like uh, it's it's not it's not from the realms of possibility, and it'd be how ironic it would be during a, a pandemic where they all would win the All Ireland and no one could celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, you're mad. But you've actually written off six teams there. You've written off the three other Leinster teams, the three other Ulster teams. You really I, have jumped yeah. on. And you wonder then, when I write off the teams on your side of the draw, you don't want it all out. <laughs> but fair enough. I went a bit far in the right. Yeah, yeah. All right, brilliant stuff, and I appreciate it. Stephen, we're going to talk about uh, Donegal against Armagh this weekend at Kingspan Breffney Park. Donegal came into the game after a 113 to 111 win over Tyrone, which, you know, considering some of the soft uh, games that the likes of Dublin and other teams would have had to get to this stage, meeting Tyrone in the first round was tough. Armagh saw off Derry uh, in the last round, 17 points to 15, putting up a decent scoreline there. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you're thinking of this particular matchup? And obviously, Donegal is winning fit as favourites. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, people on the outside will probably say one winner and one winner only in Donegal. But for me, I'm, I'm just a little bit cautious about this game. Uh, I go back to when Donegal were in their plum scene five, six, maybe seven years ago when they were really, really well organised under McGuinness and, you know, even McGallagher and things like that as well. And, you know, they were, they were, they were in the top, you know, what you would probably call top six in the country. And Armagh at that stage were nearly Division 3, floating around Division 3, bottom of 2, even in round 3 hadn't got promoted in a couple of years. McGinney's been building this team for five years. We, we spoke about that in the show before. But I even go back to then, Shane, and there was only a kick of the ball between the two teams. I think Donegal went in as one to five, one to six favourites at Crow Park that day. And it ended up a one-point win for Donegal. Armagh could have come out the right side. I can tell you one thing about it, and I can tell you one thing from Kieran McGinney. Kieran McGinney will install a serious level of belief in that Armagh panel. You know, a serious... Uh, level of confidence in them uh you know he as a city he's obviously been building the panel for a number for a number of years a lot of young lads there who have no fear absolutely no fear they were a kick of the ball away from reaching the ulster final last year um you know they've got out of division they've got out of division two they're now up to division one and i just feel that armagh have the potential to cause donegal problems and i think one of the issues that donegal might have at the weekend shane is their full back line now, Neil McGee is struggling by all accounts after the throw match. If McGee is out, it's a massive loss to them because 
Donegal's well, I suppose Armagh's energy line is their forward line. You know, that's their strength. That's that's where they're that's where they're they, they seem to be. You know, really, really excelling it at the moment. You know, they've got a lot of really really good footballers in there. You know, a lot of really good options from scoring point of view. You know, the likes of Jamie Clark, the O'Neills. You know, you've got even the likes of Falker at centre half back. Like their scores can come from everywhere. Stephen Campbell, Roy you know, Grogan. Stephen Campbell over the last couple of years has really matured as a footballer. I actually I could be wrong here, but I think Stefan's actually captain the team this year. You know, so it shows the level of maturity and thrust that McGee now has in him. And the same person maybe a couple of years ago would have been in and out of the team, you know. So I, I just think I just think Donegal need to be very cautious coming into this game. Massive hurdle to get over to Rome. A huge hurdle to get over to Rome. But they're out of Bally Buffet now. You know, they're out of Bally Buffet now. Bally Buffet suited them a little bit more with their physicality and strength. So I proceed with caution on this one. If you're if you're to look at the options that um, Declan Bonner has for the Donegal team, assuming that Neil McGee doesn't make it through, he brought on Owen McHugh, albeit for Jack McKelvey in a different part of the field the last day. Andrew McLean came on when McGee went off at half time. Paddy McGrath, he came on later in the game for Paul Brennan. Who do you think would be more likely to come in and mark the likes of Jamie Clark, Rean O'Neill, Stephen Campbell, Rory Grugan, the lads that you've talked about? Well, it, it's it's a bad week weather-wise, Shane. It's a bad week weather-wise. Oma is is not a field that, that takes the rain very, very well. It could be a sticky, heavy pitch on Saturday night, or sorry, on Sunday, I think the game is. But if, if it is that situation... I would be going with experience and I'd be going with Paddy McGrath. Paddy McGrath, for me, you know, was one of the best cornerbacks in the country, you know, a number of years ago, along with, you know, McGee, obviously, and, and uh, Frank McLean as well. If you think back that Donegal team that were in their plum, but McGrath, McGrath's got experience. If they lose McGee, you know, McGrath can go in there and fill a hole. Obviously, maybe not from a, from a height perspective, but the way Armagh play football, Armagh do like to play I think, fast football. I think Paddy it, McGrath might actually be a doubt for this one. I think uh, Declan Bonner was kind of he, ruling him out. So, yeah, we, he, he might actually have to do without him. But uh, actually, just to jump on to another point, and another player that put his hand up in the last game was Oshin Gallen. Do you think there's any hope that he might go in? Like, there's so many lads stepping up, like Kieran Thompson and Michael Langan. Yeah, listen, Oshin Gallen's a wonderful footballer and he's got great athleticism, Shane. Uh, he's got great energy, he's got great legs. He kicked a brilliant score late on in the throne game. And, you know, and that's the thing about Donegal now. You know, there's a number of young lads there, Shane, that's come through the last couple of years. And they've, they've, Donegal, Jim McGuinness, you know, for, for all the people that criticise what Jim McGinnis, style of football and what Jim Dunn was, but what Jim Dunn more than anything for Donegal, Shane, was he raised massive standards within the county, you know, both on the field and off the field. Their development squads took a complete overhaul. Declan Bonner's been involved in their development squads for as long as I can remember, because I remember coming up against them with down under 17s a long time ago. And and I remember just thinking back to myself, myself thinking, like, Donegal have got some really good personnel involved in their development squads now, the strength conditions, favourite. You know, there's a lot of money that was raised during that time that obviously was fired back into the, the development of the county. And he also gave them that great belief and that, you know, changed the whole probably she just changed the whole mindset surrounding Donegal football. It was nearly it was nearly that party type atmosphere around the town and you know, you, you, you play in the championship and you lose and you go for a few pints and that old mentality changed she all of a sudden to say, like, we are a top side, we're a top county and we should be down at the top table. And I did go back, she to the very start when we were doing these preview shows way back at the start of the National League. And I did say back then that Donegal were a team that could possibly topple Dublin this year. You you know, they were a team that winter football might suit them because Donegal football, club football traditionally has played in shocking conditions. You know, really, really bad weather, very windy pitches. A lot of pitches are on the shore, you know, in the north coast, and it's not pleasant up there on the best of days. Never mind a bad day. And a lot of football is played through the hands, and winter football tends to suit that style of football. And, you know, the last day against Jerome will have given them great confidence and great belief. But Armas, I think the only chance that Armas have for me, is if they start the game really, really well. If Armagh can get a foothold in the game early, Shane, I think they might struggle around the middle because Donegal do have the physical presence of Michael Murphy, obviously, in around the middle of the field. But Jordy O'Burns is no soft touch. Jordy O'Burns can feel the ball. He can win his own kick out. He can win his own ball. You know, he, he, for, for the size of the lad, deceptively, he, may, he might not look the biggest of footballers, but I, I tell you this now, that young lad can pluck a ball. And I just think if Armagh can start well, get early ball into their full forward line, really, really early, test on a goal, don't let them get their numbers back, don't let them get their system in place, you know, attack their kick out. You never know. You never know. Is there any part of you that wonders if a Division 2 team, which is Armagh, who have gotten promoted, 
that they might be off the level of the Division 1 side. We saw what happened with Ross Common against the Mayo team that, you know, in previous years, Mayo knew there was a back door and they were probably targeting in All-Ireland. Whereas now, when it's knockout, Mayo fairly wiped the floor at Ross Common in an awful lot of areas. So is there any concern here that Armagh against the Donegal team that knows that there's no back door might get wiped away? Yeah, well, I think the good thing for Donegal is, Shane, that they've had a two-week break now. You know, they've had a two-week break. Donegal have had that two weeks just to sort of reset, refocus. You know, the, if it had been a week, you know, you might have been asking some questions, maybe would they, would they been still living off the throne performance? But the fact that, Shane, it was two weeks, it's given them a great opportunity just to, to click the reset button, you know, get themselves back on the feet on the ground, you know, fully focused. But at the same time, Shane, and this is the thing, I suppose, about Ulster football. You know, people laugh from the outside a little bit Ulster, and sometimes it's labelled a tristal, excuse me, and it's labelled sort of boring and etc. But for me, it's interesting. You know, it's very competitive. You look at Antrim going to Cavan at the weekend, nobody give them a sniff of, of, of getting anything out of the game. But yet Antrim went really well organised, you know, kept the ball for long periods of time, probed, poked. And at the same time in the second half, Padraig Gallagher, probably the wrong man at that stage, going through with the ball, you know, at a fan or a cornerback by three, and two men off him, one on the left, one on the right. That ball had him in the net. Who's not to say that Antrim wouldn't be playing down this weekend? You know, and that's that's a Division Four team against the Division Two team, and and I just think in Ulster, you know, there is a, a mindset of there's no fear. You know, nobody really fears anybody, and and I'd say in the last ten years, every team in Ulster have been to the provincial final. In the last ten years, every team in Ulster, all nine counties have been to the provincial final. Antrim were there in 2010. You know, Fermanagh were there before as well, and Gallagher. They've all been to the provincial final, so there is no fear in Ulster. You know, Ulster's a real minefield, and, and Declan Bonner will be wary of that, but McGinley will also be wary of it, and he'll have that installed in his pairs. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to lose. Everybody's writing you off. The, you know, the, the, the circle of wagons. There'll be a real siege mentality. The one interesting thing that, that I noticed, though, Shane, just from a from a, a what I would probably call a cynical point of view, in the Donegal Tyrone game, Donegal are very very shrewd at the dark arts. They're very shrewd putting goalkeepers under pressure. They're very shrewd putting referees under pressure. There's a lot of vocal. There's a lot of vocal calls from the line. There's a lot of talking on the pitch. You know, and that's something that's that's maybe going to you know play in the in the in the heads of of. You know the officials this weekend that you know they need strong officials because I just felt at times and I said this to to the following law we're sitting watching the match like you know a lot of a lot of on the edge stuff a lot of on the edge stuff which listen which listen the best teams do it and they do it really well and hats off to them. Are there any matchups you're looking forward to here? I mean, just looking at the two teams that lined out the last day, I'm imagining Owen Ball and Gallagher might go on Jamie Clark because Jamie Clark yeah. might roam a bit away from goal and try and bring him the other way with his burning pace. And then Stephen McManaman, who I think is is an excellent forward and maybe not, probably doesn't get the recognition he deserves across the country, matching up maybe with Rean O'Neill, and that that could be another good battle, especially if Neil McGee can't make the game. So is there is there anything that you're looking forward to seeing? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what Armagh do with Randy Q. You know, and traditionally Armagh was quiet have against Tyrone as well, wasn't was he? It? He was quiet against Tyrone. Relatively he was speaking. quite. He was quite against Tyrone, and I think Tyrone had had you know targeted him. Obviously, I'd said it in the show in the lead up to the week, you know, that he would have been a, a man who they would have targeted and tried to match up with. And in the first half, Tyrone got a lot of their matchups right that day. You know, it'll be interesting to see who goes on to Michael Murphy. It'll be interesting to see who matches up in Murphy. But it'll be also interesting to see who matches up in McHugh. You know, Armagh in the past have played sort of industrious type wing forwards, the likes of Jamar Hall. You know, last year, who isn't seeing much game time this year. And I'm wondering to myself, will McGinney maybe sacrifice a forward for a more defensive type uh, thinking wing forward who can maybe track McHugh's runs or go on the flip side and may play an offensive base player to give McHugh something to think about? You know, because listen, McGinney has obviously been building this team for five years, Shane, as we said. He has, a, he has a clear philosophy on how he wants the game to be played. He likes Armand to play football on the front foot. He likes them to be open. He likes them to play attractive football. So it will be very interesting. But there's some key matchups. Oban Gallagher and Jamie Clark is a very interesting one. Oban Gallagher will go that way. He'll give Jamie Clark something to think about in the back foot as well. Because <laughs> the way the modern game is now, Shane, that when you win the ball, everybody has to be forward thinking. And when you lose the ball, everybody has to be thinking about defending as well. And I, I spoke with uh, Stevie McDonald in the lead up to this game. I spoke with him last week and he was talking about that they've been in the doldrums long enough, 12 years since they were in an Ulster final. Do you think this Armagh team believes it's good enough to get there? I think they do. I think they do. And I think this year's promotion will have given them serious confidence, Shane. You know, serious confidence uh, to, to, to kick on. 
they went to Derry. They've got the, the monkey off their back of, of winning a, a game in Ulster. You know, obviously they got that off their back last year. You know, they went to a replay against Cavan. I felt they should have beaten Cavan in the first game last year. Uh, so, you know, they, they'll have looked at it and they'll think to themselves, we'll put it like this. If Armagh on Sunday, if Armagh get over Donegal on Sunday, you know, the, the, the hunger and the thirst for an Ulster title will, 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 will be just beyond belief because they'll be looking at the other half of the draw thinking, look, you know, they've got a serious chance and a, and a, and a serious opportunity. But one concern for them, Shane, is that at this stage of the of the campaign, semi-finals, finals, at any stage really, there needs to be an element of managing the game. There needs to be an element of where, you know, you, you have to be shrewd, you have to be cute. And sometimes I just think they're nearly too honest and they're too open in the way they play at times. And I just think that if they've learned their lesson in the past, if they can manage the game, if they can ride the, the, the storm that Donegal will throw them at the different stages of the game, then I think they've got a chance. I think they've got a real chance. But the fact that it's a, it's an Ulster, you know, it's an Ulster tie, the fact that it's it's going to be played in Oba, it's going to be a, probably going to be a wild night on Saturday by the looks of the weather forecast coming in this week. It's going to give a wild and, wild and wet and windy weekend. So, you know, you never know. Hmm. I think it's actually on in Cavan, but uh, that's a wide open pitch oh, is it, too. Is it Bradley? Yeah. Sorry, apologies, yeah. apologies. Yeah. Stephen, we're going to preview your own county here, so we're looking for as little bias as possible. But as I know myself from preview in Tipperary, that can be hard to do. But just so far, uh, the, the the form guide, basically, Cavan have beaten Monaghan after extra time. That was sensational stuff. And that late winner from the uh, goalkeeper, Raymond Galligan. Then they saw off Antrim, 13 points to 9. Whereas your own down saw off for Mana eventually, 115 to 11 points. How, how, we'll start off with your own county. Are you impressed with how Down have gone about their business with Paddy Talley? Well, I'm not shocked that we're in the semi-final. You know, I expected to be here, Shane, but I'm shocked that we're playing Cavan. Uh, I thought we would have been playing Monaghan, uh, and I thought that would have been a nice subplot of the game. Conor Lavery along the line with Monaghan got up against Kilku teammates, Paul Devlin and the likes of that, you know. And I, I, I know Lav by trade, and I would say he would have done a few stories under his sleeve for those boys if, if that had happened. But but it, it's Cavan, and and, it, and it's going to be a serious challenge. It's going to be a serious physical challenge, first and foremost. It's a Cavan team who have got serious strength and serious size, and they showed against Monaghan. Although Antrim dealt with it quite well, but then Antrim are a big and strong team around the middle of the field as well. Mick McCann and that did a couple of big, big athletic guys as well in the middle of the field. But, you know, Cavan showed against Monaghan that they have physique, they have power, they have the ability to win their own kickouts, they have the ability to disrupt the opposition's kickouts. My only concern with the down team getting into the Fermanagh game was we hadn't played competitively, Shane, in seven months. There was a little bit of cautiousness about our performance in the first half. I called it out in the show last week. I felt that we had the pace. I felt we had the youth. I felt we had the energy. And we've seen that in the second half. Uh, starting the way we started on Sunday against Cavan probably won't be good enough. You know, I think we need to start the game on the front foot. I think we need to give Cavan something to think about. I think we need to go at them. Uh, you know, I think we need a break. If we're going to play defensively like we did play, well, well Paddy's teams traditionally play like that all the time anyway. But if we're going to play with, with the deep line defence and the 13 to 14 back, we need to be breaking, Shane, and we need to be breaking in numbers, and we need to be breaking with width, and we need to be breaking with pace, but we also need to have an end product. And far too many times against Fermanagh in the first half, we were turned over in key areas. We did get the numbers forward, we did break forward, but it was that final pass in the final third. And and, and very unlike certain players, you know, Paul Devlin had a bit of an off day, Donal O'Hare spilled a couple of balls, you know, Barry had a really good day, Barry O'Hagan kicked some brilliant scores on another day, though those scores, you know, there were some seriously good kick points from Barry on another day, they might not go over for him, you know, so we just we just need to be careful that when we do get those chances on Sunday, Shane, in the final third, that we do capitalise and maximise on them. We'll get into the game as underdogs, you know, Cavan have been playing a higher level of football than down over the last couple of years. Cavan got the Ulster final last year. This is a very young downside. You know, the likes of Pierce Laverty playing cornerback, Daniel Guinness. For those lads to play their first, you know, real Ulster championship game and, and you know, to get that under their... The, that, that game under their belt and the experience that that gives them, you know, it, it, it just gives them great confidence, Shane, you know, moving forward. And I just think on Sunday, we've got a big chance. I think we've got a big chance. We'll not fear Cavan, certainly not fear them. Uh, we've got the mobility and we've got the pace to cause them problems. But my only concern as a city is probably that physicality on, in the middle third on, on, on kickouts. What, like, obviously, the, the biggest player that you have to worry about when it comes to Cavan is going to be Grode McKernan. Do you see Kevin McKernan going on him, or do you think McKernan will be more sweeping back? No, no. I, I think Kevin's more suited to the sweeper role. I think Kevin will drop off at six again. Um, 
they may they may put someone like a, a Pierce Laverty on him or a, you know it's 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 hard to know who they'll put on him. It's hard to know who they put him because we don't really have that sort of standout standout individual. And and I suppose maybe looking at it, Shane, it may be a it may be just a, a situation where and it wouldn't surprise me if Down concede the kick out on Sunday. It wouldn't surprise me if they concede the Kevin kick out. Paddy's done that in the past before. He's conceded kick outs in national league games quite regularly to different teams. And he's decided that, look, we're not going to win it in the middle of the field. So what we'll do is we'll let you have it. We'll drop off. We'll get organised and we'll turn you and we'll turn you over uh, in, in our own half. And and it has worked for them in the past. It has worked for them in the past. But the problem you have then, Shane, is that it's just a slight problem. The problem you have then is that, that if you're conceding the opposition's kickouts, you're giving them a foothold in the game. But also as well, if you're going to concede the opposition's kickouts, and your own kickouts, they're going to press yours, and your own is going to become a 50 50 situation. It becomes very, very difficult to win bigger games. It becomes mm-hmm. very, very difficult to win bigger games. And I thought on Sunday we were fortunate at times that, that Fermanagh didn't really possess the offensive threat that Cavan will possess on Sunday. And as you say, you know, Cavan have got some really, really good footballers, but they've also got threats from other areas in the field as well. And for me on Sunday, if Down are to win, you know, they're going to have to be very, very they're going to be very, very well organised. They're going to have to bring a serious level of defensive intensity to that final third because on Sunday, on all too many occasions, particularly in the first half, Fermanagh get in too easy. And if they give Cavan, they afford Cavan that type of space on Sunday, we could be in trouble. Cavan's kick-out strategy last year against Donegal was they, kind of, they pressed and they got exposed, whereas this year against Monaghan, they sat back and gave it to Rory Began an awful lot. What do you see happening there? I think they'd be mad not to press down's kick out. Down have an issue in kickouts, you know, and it's it's well documented and you know it's it's not a secret. Everyone knows it, you know, we don't really have a kick out strategy as such, Shane, and it's frustrating, but you know, the argument can be made and we don't really have the physicality to, to maybe win it. Like we've got Connor Poland out there, we've got Johnny Flynn and you know, they they're, they're big enough lads, but they're not the biggest lads about, you know, and, and you know, Connor Poland may pick up McCurran at the weekend, who knows? But you know, Connor's maybe still only six footish, you know, six foot one ish, Sean. Strong lad, physical lad, but maybe just doesn't have the same but then who does have the same height and physicality is great. But I think what you'll find, Shane, on Sunday is that Cavan will go after Down's kickouts. They'll go after them and they'll go after them hard. You know, they'll probably know what to expect. They'll probably have looked at the Fermanagh game as well. I thought Fermanagh had a brave bit of joy on Down's kickouts at different occasions when they did press them. But the problem Fermanagh had as well then was that they were winning kickouts, they were turning kickouts over, but then they were turning the ball over. You know, and, and that's that's a crime because if you can win an opposition's kickout and, and keep a hold of it and get a score off it, you know, it's nearly worth two scores, you know, when you turn an opposition's kickout over. So I can only see Cavan going one way and that is going after Down's kickouts because it's 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 not you know it's it's hardly a secret that down don't have you know a massive amount of height and, and size around the middle so it would be mad to concede the kicker so when i was thinking back on the cabin against monaghan game monaghan got an awful lot of joy by with their hard running and going straight up the center and one of the things that let them down was of course fisting over for the the sensible option of the point which i've always hated anyway and i think the fisted point should be banned but that aside <laughs> do down have the running power quail on mooney aside to be able to go straight up the centre and punish them that way. And, you know, we obviously have the likes of the Johnson brothers, Donny O'Hare, those type of players. If you go at Cavan, isn't that where the joy is going to be for, for Down and then you have the scores to put them away? Well, it wasn't just Monaghan. You know, Antrim showed as well, Shane, that if you run at Cavan, you can cause them problems. You know, and Antrim created those chances. And like I said to you probably last week about the... the what Down have, what Down have, and I was chatting to McKernan during the week there about it as well, like with Kevin, and, and what Down have is, they've got blistering pace, like, it's it's one of the quickest downsides I've seen in the last 10 years, you know, Pierce Laverty's playing cornerback, but he's, he's he's playing on the front foot, Pierce comes from a small club in Down and Saul, Pierce went to the Aussie Rule Trials with Marty Clark in Dublin, he was very, very close to getting signed up by a, a professional club in, in, in Australia. You know, he's a fine specimen of an athlete. You know, he's got serious athleticism. You know, a top footballer. Probably isn't well known in the down club circuit because he plays at a little bit lower level football. But his club won the Intermediate Championship this year, Saul. They're up in the senior next year. You know, they're a small rural club just outside Dan Patrick. He's burst onto the scene this year. You have young Peter Fagan from Burn, Serious energy, serious legs. You have Daniel Guinness who for me is probably the best attacking halfback in the county right now. You know, Daniel comes from the Kerry 
Duff Club. You've a lot of new, probably unknown young lads coming through, Shane, who the opposition teams wouldn't be that familiar with because they're expecting the team to be flooded with maybe Mayo Bridge or Kalkoo men. And all of a sudden, you have these lads from Saul and Kerry Duff and the likes of that. And for me, it's a great freshness about the down team, you know. And, and obviously, you throw in Mooney. My only qualm about Keelan is that I've, I've, I've I don't mean to say this, like Keelan is a fantastic athlete, a brilliant footballer. I would love to see him produce a more consistent performance throughout the course of the 70 minutes. But then the flip side of that is that if he is only sporadic and he is coming to life, you know, now and again, he's got that blister in pace. Like when he took off for the goal, it was actually Daniel Guinness that put it on a plate for Noel O'Hare. And Daniel Guinness was, was right alongside Mooney, had broke forward from left half back. And listen, I watched Daniel in the club championship this year. He, he, he caused me a bit of heartache as well in the quarterfinal of the championship this year. But he, he has got serious athleticism, but serious strength. These lads are all now, Shane, and it's something that down teams haven't had in a long time. They've got a real gym culture behind them. You know, they've got a real... And a lot of young lads, I think, now in general, just have this. You know, they like being in the gym. They like having nice muscles. They like being in great shape. And this is this has helped and aided us as well because these lads are coming in now in fantastic condition. And then the bench... You've Ryan Johnson coming off the bench, who is at this stage, you know, Ryan must be, Ryan was with me under 21s, come back 10 years. Ryan must be close to 30 now. He must be 28, 29. You know, Ryan's got a lot of experience under his belt. You know, Ryan's coming into the game late and he's still got the athleticism. He's still got the legs. Corey Quinn from Mayo Bridge is coming off the bench when opposition teams are tired. A really, really small, you know, elusive corner forward along with Liam Cure as well. So we've got some really, really bloody good players, some real great talent. But the key thing is, Shane, staying in the game long enough that these lads coming off the bench have enough impact. And do you think that the fifth game in as many weeks for Cavan will catch up with them? Will it be a benefit? Uh, whereas down, they only played one league game and then two weeks break between the Loud and Fermanagh games. So they should be fresher. Yeah, listen, you know, you can, you can, you can punch that argument. You can say that they're going to be fresher. Um, you know, Cavan, the only thing about Cavan is they've got a bit of... They've, They've got a bit of momentum behind them, you know, after the disappointment of relegation to beat Monaghan and Clonus was huge. And then to follow that up, obviously, with a win against Antrim, uh, you know, and it was a it was a game, obviously, that probably maybe caused them more problems than than, than what they expected. But then they've had the extra day. That game was played on, on Saturday, Shane. So they'll have the extra day's recovery, which again can be a massive can be a massive help for a team, particularly in how they plot out the rest of the week and how they're gonna prepare for the game. Hmm. So if you're gonna call it, who do, what way is it gonna go? Red and black. Yeah? No question. What's the yeah. defining reason why? I well, mean, Mickey, I just, Mickey Graham, Mickey think, Graham is, uh, is uh, like, he's had a couple of years there of good game plans, big shock against Kilmacud Croaks of Mungyakta. He's, he's looking to get to a second Ulster final in a row. Yeah, listen, there's no question about it. I'm not dismissing Gavin. I'm not, I'm not dismissing him in any capacity at all. Maybe, maybe I'm letting the heart run in the head. But no, I just have a funny feeling that... that you know, it's a great opportunity for this down team to reach an Ulster final, Shane. You know, they've, they've, they've got promotion sealed a lot of weeks ago. They didn't have to worry about anything at the end of the league. You know, it was more or less done and dusted. They've had four or five weeks good preparation now coming into this game. They had a couple of early COVID cases, Corey Quinn's brother and, and Liam Kerr. They missed the last couple of weeks with, with COVID cases. And the beauty of this is now that, you know, them lads are all back now. There's no distractions. You know, they came on as subs on, on, on Sunday. I think it was it was documented on the, on the, uh, on the Sunday game or whatever that the lads were out because of that reason but it's great to have them lads back now you know there's no distractions and touch wood fingers crossed everybody comes through this week with no distractions no COVID no nonsense and we get a full run out on Sunday and, and listen the athletic grounds down have good memories there you know they beat Monaghan in an Ulster semi-final there twice you know they came back from, from the dead in, in 2012 beat Monaghan in 2017 they turned Monaghan over there as well they beat Norman in a number of National League games there the athletic grounds harbours good memories for that down team and a lot of those lads like Samuni and guys like that were involved in those games so so that, that might be a wee little bit of an edge. We're going to chat about the Leinster Senior Football Semi-Finals here now. Dublin against Leash and Mead against Kildare. Uh, Stephen, how impressed were you with Dublin against West Mead last week, winning 22 points to 11? Shane, nothing, nothing sort of surprised me with this Dublin team anymore. You know, I came away from that game thinking of myself that Dublin are... Or, sorry, I came into the game thinking Dublin could be quite vulnerable this year. You know, they're coming in with a new manager. They're coming in with fresh faces. But I was actually driving home last night and I was thinking about this. You know, one thing Jim Gavin done, Shane, was introduce new players, you know, nearly every year to keep guys. And and I was thinking the reason behind this. There's Robbie McDade, you know, who went in the other night, who had a really, really good game, really good impact. And Owen Merkin had slipped in a corner back the other night. And you looked at their defence on paper and you thought... That's, that's not that's not the team that I would have known two or three years ago, you know, and you would have 
is that would that team scare you? Probably not. But yet they still produce that same methodological performance that they always produce. You know that that the, the way they play to their game plan, Shane. The way they and I would actually probably go as far as saying the flexibility that they have in the game plan is is is, is just phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And I think one of the biggest things, Shane, about it is that by bringing these lads in, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it because nobody gets comfortable. You know, nobody gets comfortable. And I think even Dean Rock last year spent a period of time on the bench, you know, at, 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 at during the national, a couple of national Cormac league games. Costello, and, so I think Cormac Costello took over for him for a while. Yeah, he, he did because I, I, th- I think the word in the street was that uh, Gavin wasn't happy at, his, at where his percentage of free kicks were at that stage, you know. And, and it just keeps everybody on their toes. And, you know, it's a wee bit like Alex Ferguson. He was brilliant at doing it at Man United. You know, he never let anybody get comfortable. Even in 1995, go back a long time ago and I'm going off track a wee bit here maybe, but even when he got rid of Mark Hughes and Andre Kacheskis and Paul Ince that one summer, everyone in the United were going, what is he doing? He's mad, you know, those lads. But he just seen them while he's getting comfortable. You know, and he just said, no, we're going to push on. We're going to go a different direction. And I think Gavin was excellent at doing that. He never let anybody get comfortable. And he wasn't afraid, Shane, to make hard calls. Mm-hmm. You know, Brogan wasn't long getting chopped. Flynn wasn't long getting chopped. There was here, there was no sentiment. There was no sentiment and there was no, there was no like, ah, you know, play amateur. He's been a great servant. There's none of that, you know, fresh blood in. And by bringing this fresh blood in, these lads haven't really tasted. They might have been in panels. And they might have picked up a, a token gesture medal, but they haven't been in the starting team. And now that they're in, they want it, and they want to hold on to it. And that gives them a great drive and a great hunger. And I go back to that conversation I had with Johnny Cooper a number of years ago in Scaries in the Easter coaching camp. And he says to me, he says, Stevie, everybody thinks that we're training in these high-tech science labs and these real fantastic facilities. He says, our training facilities are just the normal. They're the same as everyone else's. What drives us, he says, is the competition within the panel. And if you're not doing it, Someone else is going to do it for you. And that's the big thing, Shane. And that's what they have that a lot of other counties don't have. And they've got that real incessant desire and hunger to go after teams no matter who they are. And say the other night, it was just a little sort of message to say, look, yes, we're playing West Mead, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to put our foot in your throat straight away and we're going to keep it there. You know, and the first 10 minutes just set the tone. Now, West Mead were their own worst enemies as well, the way they set up. They set up very defensively, but then they didn't really have a plan outside of that. It was just get numbers back and hope that that plugs holes. And against Dublin, what you have to do, Shane, is you have to manage the game. You know, you have to try and take the sting out of the game. You have to control the game. You have to try and play it in your terms. You know, and I felt at times West Mead just played into their hands. You know, Dublin got a score. Goalkeepers racing to get another ball, set it up quickly, kick it back out. Dublin win again straight away. And it, it just plays into their hands. You know, they want the game at high, high energy, high intensity. They want to go after your kick out straight away. And it, it's just... Leinster for me, Shane, at the minute is dead. Like it, it is dead, and it's it, it's unfortunate because I would even think the other two teams are just thinking to themselves, like me and Kildare are probably thinking, you know, what what's the point? Like Leash came back from a really a really good performance on Sunday past there against Longford uh, to to win by two points, and there was great celebrations at the end of the game, and I was chuckling to myself, looking at them celebrating, saying, "Good luck, boys," you know, because the juggernaut's coming on Sunday for you. Well, it, we'll put it like this. Can you make a case for Leash? And like if they're falling behind twice against Longford, once by six points, then by five, and they probably would have been beaten only for Longford missed a couple of one on ones. Longford are obviously down in Division Three. Like it's very hard to make a case for him keeping the ball even kicked out to Dublin here. No, I, I, I can see this, Shane. I can see this being a bigger scoreline than the Westmeath game. Westmeath beat Leash by 12 points or 11 points in the National League this year, you know. And that's a big concern of mine. I, I don't think, I think Leash were quite fortunate to stay up. But I don't think they're a particularly good side. I think they were a better side two years ago under John Sugar. I don't mm-hmm. think, I think they've, I think they've regressed a little and I think they were very fortunate to get a couple of results this is, year. Is that but because, I, is that I, I because do, the likes of Donny Kingston isn't on the team anymore? He's opted out. And... Uh, Donny Kingston's not on the team anymore. I don't think Stephen Atreides are, you know, I, I, they've lost the keeper uh, uh, Brody as well I don't know where he's disappeared to but but they were they were big players for them you know and, and listen you know Suguru was a shrewd manager he was a shrewd coach you know he had them well set up I, I don't know much about Mike Kirk I'm not going to make a judgement on his, on his managing but I, I just think if they go into this game Shane naive enough to think that they can take Dublin on and, and have a go at them I think I, I think it, it could be anything you know and I, I feared a little bit for Westmead on Saturday night because I felt watching the game oh this could open up. But in fact, in the second half, actually, to be fair to Westmead, they plugged away, she and they kept at it. But I think a lot of that was down to Dublin, just the job's done. Let's just keep the bodies right till next week. And I think a lot of that was that, you know. But I said to you, she on the show a number of weeks ago, this is just a ticket over exercise for Dublin. This is just to get Dublin up to speed. 
up to scratch, trial a few things. I would say there's probably a few things being trialed, even their system, you know, they're trying Kilkenny in a different role. Kieran Kilkenny, for me, has probably been the player that's evolved the most over the last number of years. From that sort of link player, that sideways passes, he was doing a chat show with me and Mark Poland up in the Savile Club last year. We were a good bit of crack with him, and, and I was giving him a bit of stick. I said to him, you know, so you, you, all you do is get the ball and pass it seven yards here, seven yards there. I was calling the Ray, the Ray Wilkins of Gaelic, you know, sideways football, or Ray Lord Reston used to just kick the ball left and right, but he must have had 200 possessions a game. But he uh, he was laughing and joking, and they're two good lads. Him and Dean Rock were up at that, and, and Shane, they're, this is the thing about them as well, too. You know, and I can only judge this on the likes of Kilkenny and Rock from the time I spent chatting them, like, Real humble guys, you know, really humble guys who aren't getting ahead of themselves, you know, just go about their business. And he took a fair few slaps and a fair few hits the other night, but there's no retaliation, there's no petulance, there's no, there's none of that. I just don't see any weaknesses with them. I really don't, you know, and it's just phenomenal at how I actually said to, to, to follow somebody, Kerry, I know they're out. But Kerry on their day are easier on the eye than Dublin. You know, Dublin just are a little bit more systematic. Everything is very systematic and, you know, everything is done to a real methodical nature. And, and, and it's just the system, the process. But you have to respect that. They're the best coach team I've ever seen. Ever yeah. seen. Yeah, and they're so interchangeable. The, the other semi final, actually, and one thing to add in the fact that Leash are playing them at Crow Park rather than, you know, in, oh. in Port Leash or Mullingar or somewhere like that. I think only adds to their woes. Uh, Mead against Kildare. Um, Mead beat Wicklow 7-14 to 7 points. An absolute beat down. Whereas uh, on the other side of things, Kildare beat Offaly by 20 points to 16. And you would have to say, if Kildare are only beaten, you know, let's be respectful to Offaly, but, you know, they're not a top team, 20 points to 16, you know, they should be putting up the sort of scoreline that maybe Mead put up against Wicklow. You'd have to nearly favour, favour the Royals here. Well, awfully, Shane, awfully are not a bad side. They're not a bad side. Last year, I went to, to uh, Navin to watch awfully play Mead live because Carlo were going to play the winner's strike two years ago and in the championship. And awfully should have beat Mead that day. They were six points up in Navin. You know, they had Mead beaten and Mead came back and won the game by a point. Awfully, I probably just wouldn't, I wouldn't be as dismissive of the result as a lot of Kildare. See, this is the problem with Kildare, Shane. Kildare people in general have a huge opinion of themselves as a county. And I, and I think it's a little bit like here and down. They need to understand that they're not at the level of where they used to be at under the likes of McGinney 10 years ago. They're not at that level right now. You know, they're rebuilding. They have a lot of young lads. They won an All-Ireland Under-21 Championship with Davey Burke, who is now the Wicklow manager. You know, so they have a lot of those young lads bringing in the all of those young lads. I suppose it's worth mentioning as well, Shane. It would probably be remiss of us not to mention it that... Uh, young Neil Flynn who came on who played uh, with the day after burying his father which I felt was was such was the story of the weekend for me Shane to be honest with you I thought it was a, a wonderful story you know and, and testament to the lad that came out on the Sunday and there was a, a picture of him on the field actually at the end of the game I don't know if you've seen it on circulating mm -hmm. on social media you know so it, it was it would have been an emotional day for them Shane I think as well with, with that hanging over as well so I, I just think coming in this weekend I'm expecting a high scoring game I'm expecting a very open game uh, me and you have talked about me football we've talked about how they're progressing how unlucky they've been in division one and Colin Nally coaching them you know he, he's very innovative he's very progressive and, and I think they're going in the right direction I think they're going in the right direction and to be honest with you out of both teams I would love to see Meath back in the Leinster final against Dublin because I think Meath would have learned a lot more over the last couple of years than Kildare would have had because Meath have been exposed to Dublin a couple of times rather than Kildare and I think that if Kildare were to beat Meath at the weekend, I think that Kildare would be cannon fodder for Dublin in the final. But I really, really would love to see Meath get over this weekend because I do feel, and I'm not suggesting in any way that Meath could catch Dublin, okay? But I do feel Meath would give Dublin a good game. I think they would give them a good game and I think people would be very ignorant and very dismissive to not think that they could give them a good game. Yeah, because I saw them at Parnell Park, I suppose it's uh, three or four weeks ago at this point, and they only lost by four points to Dublin. And again, it comes back to what Leash are facing by going into Croke Park rather than playing them in a smaller venue. But I, I was quite impressed with them. And like Brian Menton coming through midfield, even watching Ronan Jones against Monaghan, his ability to run at defences, they do have a bit of pace and they have some dangerous forwards like Shane Walsh and Thomas O'Reilly and you know Brian McMahon and the Wallaces. You know, they do have a lot of pace around the field. But it, is it ultimately going to be enough to, to bring them from losing by 18 points to four, was it last year in the Leinster final? to, you know, fair enough seeing off Kildare here and obviously they have to play that match, but are they have they done enough to bridge the gap somewhat to make it a really competitive game? 
Well, well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that as the final. I was at it. I was actually yeah. at the game. Uh, I sat up in the in the Hogan stand and I watched the game. And I really watched it from an analytical point of view. She and I love going to watch county football. You know, different provinces, different styles. And you know, I went to that game with a friend of mine, and I said, and I spoke to Nally about this. Spoke to Colin about this, and he agreed with me. He says, "Well, thank you." He says for saying that because a lot of people wouldn't see that in that Leicester final. Shane, me did cause problems for Dublin in that first half. Now Dublin had only registered five points at half time. They only registered five points, but the problem Meath had been in at half time was they had only registered one or two themselves, oh, and that had really drained the confidence and lifeblood out of Meath at that stage because they'd done so much right, Shane, but they had nothing to show for it in the scoreboard. And I think if they could just get that element right, you know, I think they'd be a lot closer. I don't think the scoreline was was suggestive of 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 of, of the how the game had had evolved, you know, particularly in the first half. But I think once Meath went in at half time and and had given as much as they'd given to their game plan and the way they set up. And Colin's very, very true. Like he, he knows a lot about Dublin and, and he, he sees a lot of things about Dublin that other teams wouldn't see. For example, the likes of Brian Fenton. Brian would play in the periphery of Dublin's system, right? But Brian's their out ball. He's their out ball that when they turn the ball over, they're looking for him straight away. He's nearly playing like a what's the right word to say? Nearly cheating. You know, he's nearly playing on the edge. He's not going back in to do the donkey shift. They're using him, Shane. Nearly, nearly in, in this sort of, a, if they're back here, he's nearly in this area here, just waiting for the ball to break down and he's the link and he's the out ball, you know, for them to, to launch attacks in the opposition. And, and and I just talked as well, Colin talked as well about, about their defensive shape, Shane, as well, about having this safety net you know, in between their two lines. And the reason it works for them so well is that nobody gives them anything to think about up here. Whereas he said in the National League, Meath did get them turned four or five times. They did create three or four goal chances. Now, creating goal chances, Shane, against Dublin are is unheard of. Mm. But to create three or four in the one game makes me think to myself, maybe Meath are going in the right direction, you know, as regards closing the gap in Leinster a little bit. But Shane, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be controversial here and, you know, say something outside the norm. But I do think that the likes of Meath and Kildare need to look at themselves. You know, I think certain counties in Leinster really need to take a strong look at themselves and say to themselves, like, are you going to continue to let this gap get bigger and bigger and bigger? Because what can happen, Shane, is if you tell yourself something over and over and over again, you'll start to believe it. You know, you'll start to believe it. If you tell yourself that you're a really, really good player, you're a really good player, a really good player, someone's telling you that all the time, you're going to start to believe it. You know, but and if you're listening to the narrative surrounding Dublin, they are unquestionably the greatest team we have seen that I have ever seen, right? They are. But they're beatable. Every team's beatable. You know, they have to be beaten sooner or later. But if the media are consistently telling you this message, sometimes you can get into a team's psyche, Shane. It can, like Leinster, like most counties in Leinster have just thrown the talent. You know, what's the point in the Leinster Championship? Well, the point should be that you want to go out and give your best every single week. You want to be competitive. Like we, when we went up again Dublin in 2007, Shane, you're going to laugh at the people laughing and say, I fully believe we could take them down the stretch. Fully believed it. And like after 40 minutes, the game was 9 6, and Damon pushed the linesman. If he gets sent off, we stay in that game right till the end. Dublin got five points in that game from the 71st minute to the 75th minute. But we had a specific strategic game plan to contain them, to make it difficult for them, for us to get long periods of possession to grow into the game. 58% possession we had in the first half that night. And there was one score in it at half time. You know, you've got to see people. I listen to these agents on Twitter and social media talking about, oh, there's no point in parking the bus and defensive football, etc., etc. But to win the game, Shane, you need to stay in the game. You know, you need to be in the game. If you go out in ten minutes like West Meath done and just throw the down and just go out and you're five or eight, nine points down, the game is over. But try and stay in the game and give yourself those chances, you know. And I think a lot of teams need to be starting to look at that, particularly when they've got against stronger sides. Yeah. A huge blow for Mead is that James McEntee he's likely to be out for the rest of the championship. But just to just to even just go um at these games, Dublin obviously to win. Are you expecting Mead to come through as well? And by the way, do you think Lee should do that, throw everyone behind the ball? Well, listen, I think if Lee's going in on Saturday night, is it Saturday night or Sunday? Is it uh, Sunday? That one is on on Sunday, yeah. It's on Sunday. So if Lee's going to that game, Shane, you talked about the Crow Park factor. There's no team in this country that knows Crow Park inside out like Dublin. You know, every inch of it. And, you know, the, the, the width that they'll get in their game, the runners that they'll have, you know, the intensity that they'll bring, the press that they'll put on the kick out. I, I just feel that if Leash don't go in, if Leash go in with any other way of playing than being cautious and trying to stay in the game they'll be blown out of the water in 15 minutes and it, it honestly could end up anything I'm joined by Stephen Poacher to talk all things football Stephen we'll jump straight into it last weekend 
having looked at all the different games, I mean, there were so many matches on, but if we talk about Cork beating Kerry just, with, you know, at the death, Down beating Cavan, Mayo uh, pulling away from Roscommon as that game went on, well, throughout the game, and Dublin beating Westmead by double scores, 22 points to 11. You kind of noticed that there were an awful lot of different styles and systems, and uh, you're going to probably talk through it and then go on to the tactics board and show us. Yeah, I suppose, Shane, you know, looking at the four games across four different provinces, I've probably seen sort of, you know, distinct features in, in every game. Um, you know, if we start, for example, in Ulster, you know, the down for mana game, like down sort of played a very deep line defence in the first half, a very cautious, patient game with the with the idea behind it that in the second half they were going to open up a bit and obviously spring their substitutions and spring their runners. And in Leinster, I suppose Dublin set the tone early with that really, really incessant uh, zonal press that they like to put on teams early and, and you know the, the game was more or less over in, inside 10 minutes on the back of, of, of the press that they put in Westmead's kick out and then obviously you look at Connacht and you look at, at, at Roscommon and, and Mayo and you look at Mayo and Mayo have sort of gone with a with a real man-to-man type press all over the field you know still very reliant on their on their six defenders at the back and then in, in, in Munster surprisingly in Munster it was probably one of the most tactical uh, affairs of the weekend in, in that court, court played Kerry and Kerry decided to adopt like a, a middle third type press but the problem that came with it, and I'll show it in a second on the tactics board, was that when with Kerry's middle third press, what that allowed was that when they did turn Cork over at different occasions, they didn't have a target to kick. And their runners, the likes of White and the likes of Murphy, you know, were probably, it may be extreme in saying it, but they were nearly cynically and systematically fouled in the middle third by Cork, you know, by the likes of Dean and guys like that. And to be fair to Cork, you know, they turned the game very attritional and, and made it a real war of attrition. But I suppose, Shane, if we start with Dublin, for example, and we start with the, with the zonal press that, that Dublin would have put on against uh, Westmead on Saturday night, you know, from the first kick out straight away, you would have a normal six forwards up front. But what Dublin do, Shane, is is they, is, they, is they like to push men on. So by pushing men on into this type of situation here, you, you are faced with a sea of blue, of complete blue. And, you know, really and truly, it's, it's a massive risk and reward that they're putting on now. The difference that Dublin have in comparison to other teams is they've got the physicality, they've got the strength, they've got the athleticism, so that if they do lose this this kicker, they still have that athleticism and that ability to get back in. But it is so they're so methodical, Shane. They're so organised, they're so systematic, and they put the Westmead goalkeeper under fierce pressure early, fierce, fierce pressure. And I go back to Niall Morgan talking about the All Ireland final in two thousand and eighteen, where he talked about that first ten minutes against Dublin where he says that sea of blue, that press, that zonal press, he says it's, it's hugely intimidating, Shane, for a goalkeeper. And it sets the game up. It just sets the tone straight away for Dublin to get a foothold in the game. But these lads, Shane, aren't just static. It's not like this. They're moving side to side. Their hands are up. They're shouting. They're roaring. And in fact, on Saturday night, it was that aggressive a press at different at different uh, occasions that Martin McNally, the referee, actually cited one of the Dublin players for... Uh, whatever it was, I don't know what it was for screaming or shouting at the goalkeeper because it had got that much, you know. So if you're a goalkeeper and you're being put under that pressure, it's a serious, serious uh, 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 thing to deal with, you know, particularly early in a game when you're playing Dublin, you know. Mm. Uh, but I suppose, Shane, if, if we look, if we look then at, at the different types of, of zonal, of zonal organisation from teams. So, for example, if we take... The Kerry game, for example, you know, and we use this as the Kerry defence. What Kerry had was, Kerry had themselves quite reasonably well set up in the middle third, but they brought out, for some strange reason, they brought their forward line out. And what we found was we found the likes of Shawnee O'Shea, David Clifford, you know, Brosnan. We found these guys operating in these areas here. And what it actually did, Shane, was it actually, when Cork did break lines, Cork got a lot of joy in little pockets of space in around here. That's where Cork found joy. That's where Cork ultimately actually got their winning goal from. Six, the six Cork six broke through the cordon at the very end, got himself into this area here, set up a scoring chance in here. It was popped back out to Conley. He took the pot shot. Uh, Keane caught it and put it in the net. But it was this area here that was causing Kerry problems. And it was an interesting concept that Kerry tried to, tried to employ. And I'm thinking, Shane, were Kerry thinking further on down the line. You know, where they're thinking that, you know, to stop Dublin, to play against Dublin, they're going to have to flood the middle third. It's not going to work for them. But then, Shane, I suppose you take a different approach. You take Down's approach on Sunday, 
where Kevin McKernan at six would have dropped off as a sweeper. So McKernan was a sweeper. Then we had a lot of bodies back. So what we would have found was we would have found this situation here with Down and Sunday. We would have had a very, very deep line defensive unit with Down. You know, and, and the problem that, that happened, the problem that happens there is that well, one, it's a very tiring system. You know, two, if you do break forward, it's very difficult to press the opposition's kick out because you've got numbers back. You're having to get numbers up the field. So the likes of Fermanagh can get their kick outs away. And on Sunday, it might not be a bad thing for Down to actually concede the kick outs because they are playing Cavan, who have a distinct physical advantage over them, you know, particularly the likes of Garoy McKernan and guys they got in around the middle. So it mightn't be a bad thing to concede the kick outs. But the, the, the issue that Down had in the first half, Shane, with this is that, you know, yes, you can limit the opposition chances, but when you win the ball, it is very difficult if only one and two are going. You know, when you win the ball, you need fours and fives going, you need options, but you also need an option up here inside. You also need a point man. And Down did leave Donald O'Hare there, Paul Devlin and Jerome Johnson at different occasions. So it has its merits, it has its pluses, particularly against teams, you know, it depends obviously the opposition and who you're playing. But at the same time, it can be cause very, very difficult for teams to sustain that for 70 minutes. And then obviously we look at, at, at Mayo. We go back and look at Mayo against Roscommon at the weekend. You know, you have the six Mayo forwards here. And what Mayo's forwards do very, very well, what they do very, very well is is that they commit to a press. They commit to a press. You know, and it, it is a man-to-man type system. They like to press forward. They like to push the opposition's kickouts. They like to squeeze that territory in here and put the opposition in the back foot. But what they're doing, Shane, by doing this is when they do this and when they put that press on, they are leaving themselves quite vulnerable at the back here, you know, in a 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 situation. And I just think that if this is going to work for Mayo moving forward, they will need to review this when they play the likes of Dublin because if they set up like this against Dublin and they try and press high, Dublin and the athleticism and the runners to break those lines and cause them serious difficulties. So I'm going to bring up an image on screen that you, you had on Twitter the other day and it was about how Kerry didn't set up like this but all too often they ended up with a cautious middle, a cautious middle uh, third press. So it's just up there on screen. And you talked about it, and i just to read out the rest of your tw- t- tweet. Uh, problems came when they turned Cork over, a kick pass was redundant, and in a strategic foul-ridden performance, Cork matched up perfectly on Kerry's linebreakers from deep, who were Tomas O'Sullivan, Paul Murphy, and Gavin White. So I'm just going to leave that up there for a second. Can you, can you expand on that point a little bit more? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, Shane, you know, I'm just looking at it here now, like, I'm just, I've got my notes here, like, Dean, Dean went on to Murphy, okay, so Dean went to Murphy, O'Rourke went on White, and, and Collins went on, on Tom O'Sullivan, so Tom O'Sullivan and, uh, Tom O'Sullivan, Gavin White, and Paul Murphy, in the last two National League games, were causing serious, serious problems on the front foot. So Kerry had set up in a similar fashion, Shane, against Monaghan. They'd set up in a very similar fashion against Donegal. But the difference was, Shane, that they were getting their runners through. They were getting their line breakers going. You know, Murphy was coming from deep. White was coming from deep. O'Sullivan was coming from deep. But the, the, the difference was against Monaghan and against Donegal as well, Shane. They always had a tread inside. So they had that option of kicking the ball to Clifford or Brosnan. But on Sunday, what happened was that when they did turn the ball over on Cork, You had the likes of O'Rourke, you had the likes of Dean, who were systematically fouling Gavin White. Like, if you, I would love to see the statistics, and I I think someone had a tweet up earlier about the statistics. I have that actually, yeah. I'll bring that up on screen as well. Um, Bring that up out of interest. Yeah, so this is uh, Morris Brosnan, he tweeted. Pop quiz, doing some work on the Cork v Kerry game. I reckon of the 71 fouls in the entire match, 37 were committed by starting defenders, midfielders. One defender went the whole game without committing a foul. Any guesses? And uh, I actually read through that earlier. Can you guess who it is, uh, Stephen? The, the one defender who didn't commit a foul? Yeah. In the court team? In the entire game. Oh, in the entire game. Maybe I'll take a podcast, Paul Murphy. It was Tyg Morley, actually. Okay. Uh, 30, right. 33 of those fouls were Cork, which means that the rest of them were Kerry, which means they're obviously sinners as well with 38. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no question about it. Listen, you know, Kerry did commit some... Kerry's tackling at times. I actually felt, uh, she in, in this middle third on Sunday pass, Kerry didn't have the defensive intensity needed 
you know, to turn Cork over. I thought Cork, Cork turned it into a real traditional affair, a real battle. And when Kerry did turn the ball over, at times they were held up, you know, they were, they were burr hugged at different occasions, you know, really, really cynical fouls. And I thought the referee on the day from Tipperary was very lenient. He didn't produce any early cards, which would have put Cork under a little bit of pressure. You know, some of the black cards that he issued as well, I thought were a little bit dubious, you know, particularly particularly for Kerry. I thought some of them were, were, were quite harsh. But I just felt that on Sunday... You know, we could talk about Kerry and what went wrong, but Cork did an awful lot right. And we, I had said on your show last week, Shane, that they had nothing to fear. You know, and I wasn't being disrespectful, but they did not have nothing to fear. Cork are a massive county, half a million people, serious resources, you know, massive population. There's no reason why counties like Cork shouldn't be dining at the top table. And if we go back to last year and the whirlwind start they got against Dublin in the Super 8s, and it was a great start. And I personally felt that if they'd have managed that game a little bit better, they could have actually beaten Dublin last year. There's no question about it. But they've sprinkled the team this year. They've introduced a lot of under-21s. They've introduced that team that won it all Ireland. And that fills your team and your squad full of confidence. And what they have now going forward, is fantastic confidence. Someone said to me there over the weekend, and they're completely right, or last couple of days, I think it was in school, like it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise you if Tip beat Cork. Well, I don't think, I think, yes, it, it wouldn't have surprised me two or three years ago, but it's not going to happen this year. They'll not be caught, you know, after beating Kerry, their feet will plant, be planted fairly back in the ground on Tuesday. They'll refocus and they'll say to themselves, we are two games away from an All Ireland final. We're one game away from an All Ireland semi final. Let's get back to Crow Park and let's see what happens. And who knows? For me, they're on the lesser side of the draw. You know, they've obviously got the winners of Connacht, so it's a huge opportunity. I wouldn't have fancied them against an Ulster team, and I certainly wouldn't have fancied them against Dublin in the semi-final. But against a Mayo or a Galway, Cork will win there with serious confidence and serious, serious belief. You're cutting this tip man fairly deep. When we beat Mayo in an All-Ireland semi-final, I'll be coming back to you in a big way with this. I know it is unlikely. It is unlikely, and Cork could be massive favourites. One question I want to ask you, though. Do you see that Kerry setup as being a setup that is not progressive, or do you feel that they did pick something that suits them, but they just weren't able to execute it for whatever reason on the day? Yeah, I, I think there was a little bit of fear, Shane. I think there was a little bit of fear about Cork, about Cork's athleticism, you know, about Cork's running power. People were very dismissive of Cork, although they were Division Three. But if you actually look at the statistics, Shane, of Cork's Division Three record, you know, they were averaging over twenty points a game. They were averaging over 20 points a game in Division 3. They had a score difference of like plus 46, plus 47. I said last week that breeds confidence. You know, it really breeds confidence. They are one team who, for me, looking across the board at what's left in the country, they're the one team that physically, you know, can, can dine at the top table. You know, and, and I had this discussion today with a guy actually in school, strength conditioning coach, uh, John McMahon. He's in doing a bit of work with, with, with our uh, like an outreach program with our young lads. And John would have been doing the strength conditioning for Derry a number of years ago and he would have shadowed the likes of, of Michael Kennedy, the Dublin player development coach and stuff in the past and would have spent a bit of time at Leinster Rugby and he, he said to me, he says, like, you know, strength condition wise, like Dublin are so far ahead of the pack, you know, everything's in place and you know, Brian Cullen's obviously in charge of their S and C and you look at the, the you look at the condition that they're in, Shane, you know, the strength of Kieran Kilkenny and be able to take hits and ride tackles and, and things like that. But Cork are up there as well for physicality and strength. They are just as equally as strong and equally as physical. And I thought on Sunday, I, I just felt Kerry went in and what they do is put it like this, Shane, I think the best way to describe it. If Kerry had went in and made it a shootout, if they'd have went in and made it a shootout, they would have won the shootout. But they went in and made it a battle and they lost the battle. 